Okay, so um, early on in the first few lectures, Horatio sort of emphasized that our point of view is practical. <laughs> okay. And for us, maybe we have this ambition, maybe, of classifying Fano manifolds from this viewpoint. Okay. And so what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to start with the simple side of the picture. So we want to start with um, a Fano polytope. Because that certainly seems a lot easier than to go away and try and find Fano manifolds. Okay. And we've seen in this class that, you know, if you give me a Fano polytope, then there are various things I can do to it. Like, I can mutate it. And that's just the QG deformation from, um, well, from one toric variety XP to another toric variety XQ. Okay. So that's one of the things we can do. And, you know, this seems very successful. It preserves the period sequence and things like that. So, I mean, this seems like a good thing to be doing. Um, and it's all very good. But how on earth do we move from having a polytope to having a Fano orbifold? Okay. So I guess the crucial question is how do we get from P or maybe XP to a Fano orbifold X? Or just as crucial, um, how do we find the mirror F? Okay. And in general, we don't know. Okay. But fortunately, there's a large collection of cases where we can certainly do this. And what we do is we do the Horiwafa construction backwards. Okay. So one way we can do this, or so sometimes we can do this. I.e. we can find an X and an F via um, Laurent inversion. And so yesterday I gave you a whole series of examples that were trying to illustrate this method. So yesterday's examples, um, I was starting with a polytope P and I was trying to find some way of assigning combinatorial data to P that allows me to sort of Back build the Hori Rafa construction to recover the final order for the fold X and the mirror F. Okay. And when it works, it works really well. Okay. But making a sort of precise statement about when it works is not something we really know how to do. Okay. So from the practical point of view, This is the best tool that we've got. And frankly, if it doesn't work, then you're in a world of pain. You have to really sort of struggle to do this. Okay. And fortunately, the vast majority of Fano manifolds can be constructed in this way. So um, of the 105 um, Fano um, threefolds of Mario Mackay, I think it's at least 78 of them 
got it written down. Oh, no, I don't have it written down. So I think anyway, at least 78 of them can be built as a toric complete intersection. You're using techniques like this, okay? And there's the case of um, arbifold del petzels. with um, a third one, one singularities. Um, in that case, you know, we have 26 of these mutation equivalence class of polytopes, and most of them admit a Laurent inversion, a scaffolding. Like I say, when it doesn't, you've got a whole different problem, but it does seem to do the vast majority of cases, so it's not a sort of technique to be ignored. All right, so let me try and make precise what I think a scaffolding is. Definition. Okay. Yeah. Can you sort of characterize when? I don't know. Do you have a. Ah, okay. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but that's really just an obstruction to be in a TG. I mean, yeah. Yeah, we don't know, basically. Okay, so there is one issue, which I'll, I'll explain it, why not? Okay, so in this case, um, it turns out there are actually um, 29 um, del petzels with a third one, one singularities. Okay, which is not equal to 26. Okay, and so what's going on here? Well, these three additional cases. They all have um, H naught empty. Okay, so this means they can't be of class TG. They can't admit a toric degeneration. And Alessio's point is so far, this is really the only obstruction that we know of. Um, no, it's not actually. It's just nobody knows a model for which it works. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, they are, I know. I think Tom was asking whether they have H naught zero, which is not the case. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we just don't know if they have a complete intersection description. All right. So definition. So I want to define this process of Laurent inversion. So a way of at least conjecturally moving from the polytope to X and the mirror F. Okay. So I'm just everything's happening in a lattice N, and I'm going to fix a basis for N for all time. So let's just fix a basis B of N. And I'm going to um, fix a partition of this basis for all time. So it's a partition S1 
SC and U of B. And I want these SIs non empty. So I'm just going to define SI to just be one of the SI circles, and then I'm just going to throw in the origin. And I'm going to define the simplex delta i to just be the convex hull of these points. So these delta i, they're basically just a collection of standard simplices. So then a strut D is just given by. So I'm going to take each of these simplices in turn. And I'm going to allow myself to translate the simplex by one of its vertices. Okay. And remember that the origin is one of the vertices. And then I'm allowed to dilate it. by some non-negative amount d. And I'm going to then take the Minkowski sum of this for every vertex. And then the Minkowski sum of that for every strut, uh, for every simplex. So I get this. So as I try and move one of these simplices further away from the origin, it necessarily becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And then also, once I've done that, I'm going to allow myself to translate the whole thing by this collection U of basis elements that we didn't use to construct simplices. So the U, thinking back to yesterday, are the uneliminated variables. And so here, we need all the coefficients to be non-negative. Okay. So now let's award ourselves a final polytope inside that lattice. So let P be final polytope. Okay. Then a scaffolding on P. With respect to this basis and this choice of partition, um, is a collection of struts. Um, whose convex hull and the convex hull of the eliminated variables gives us P. No, I'm not, because these. This is just a point. So it's yeah. Th these Bs, they're also just points. So it's, yeah, sure, but. So this is just the point, so all I'm doing is translating. So it's defined, yeah. Yeah, let me say that again in case some people didn't catch it. So this delta is indeed a simplex, okay? Um, then so we're just subtracting a point off it, so that's just the translation of the simplex. That's no problem. Then we're dilating it. Then we're taking a bunch of Minkowski sums. And then finally, this is just a sum of a collection of points, so we can just translate 
again. Let's define by that. And then finally, a scaffolding is just a collection of struts and the unilaminated variables that fill out P. So very much like we were doing in the examples yesterday. Let me just, you know, using this notation, just do an example. So I'm going to start with P. that looks like this. And I'm going to describe a scaffolding on it. So the origin is sitting here. And this whole thing is in N R. And for those of you who have been keeping track, this is one of those third one one polytopes. Okay. So the first thing is I need to fix the basis. So in this case, I'm going to fix B to just be 0, 1, and 1, 1. Okay. And now I need to choose my partition. Well, I'm just going to have S0 to be 0, 1. And I'm going to have my own eliminated variables to be 1, 1. So delta is just the convex hull of the origin and S0. So delta is just a little line segment. A little vertical line of unit length. And now I'm going to pick some struts. So I'm going to I'm going to define two struts in this language. But from the examples yesterday, I think you might know what I'm going to do. So my first strut in this language is I'm going to take three lots of delta, and then I'm going to subtract off 1, 1. And then my second strut, I'm going to take one lot of delta, and I'm going to subtract off 0, 1. So I've done two different things here. This first one, I've, if we look over that expression, I've taken delta and subtracted off the origin and then dilated by a factor of 3. And then I've subtracted off my uneliminated variable. Just like I'm allowed to do. The second one is slightly different. I've taken delta and subtracted off one of its vertices, dilated by a factor of 1, and then subtracted off no copies of the unilaminated variables. So let me try and make that clearer. So in this case, my coefficients, my d's and my c's, I have um, d, 0, 0, equal to 3, and d, 0, 1, is equal to 0. Bless you. And C, 1, 1 is equal to 1. And in this case, I have D of 0, 0 is 0. I have D of 0, 1 is 1. And C of 1, 1. What's that? Yeah, there's no I because it's just one. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, just a bit lazy. Yeah. And so this defines a scaffolding because P is equal to the convex hull of U union T1 union T2. Okay. And if I just draw a picture of what the net result looks like, just like the pictures we were drawing yesterday, T1 is along here. D2 is here. And then my unilaminated variable is at this point here. And 
And this circle here is my U. And delta would be this line segment. But the conditions that I've put on how I've defined the strut and how I've defined the scaffolding are basically just a bit of a con. It's so that the conditions we have in the Horiwafa construction will be satisfied. Okay. And so one thing I can do is I can try and reinterpret what the, um, the divisor map D looks like in terms of this data. So let me just just so we don't get into too much of a notational nightmare, let me define a couple of vectors. So for a strut T, okay, um, we're going to record the coefficients D, um, A, I, and C, B. Remember these are non-negative. In some vectors. So in vectors. So the i will just be the coefficients from the di simplex and um, d is just going to be the coefficients from the unaluminated variables. And I'm also going to define the sum of the di's. So I'm going to write li to just be the sum of the di's. And again, this is going to be a non-negative integer. Once I've done that, associate it to a scaffolding. We have a matrix. And it's a N by D plus C plus N matrix. Okay. And this is just D. And it just starts off by having an identity block. So in the Hori Rafa construction, this identity block corresponds to the basis of L dual. Then I'm going to just stick my vectors D in. So they just live here. And there's a bunch of vectors. Um, how many of these do we have? We have, what did we say? It's a C of them. And then finally, I'm going to stick in my coefficients coming from the unaluminated variable. Um, sorry. That's right. Oh, no, 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 no. These are meant to be the vectors. I've. It's the, I've indexed each vector by the, by the um, index of the strut. 
So this is meant to be, yeah, this is meant to be the vector corresponding to the first strut. And then this is the vector corresponding to the nth strut. Yeah. And I'll just write that down. So we're rows, yeah, uh, indexed by struts. And you know, I can also write down a bunch of column vectors that are going to become my divisors. So I can write um, L, Li, which is just going to be these L, um, Li's. Uh, oh, yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's meant to be the dimension of n, the lattice. It's the rank of the lattice. It should be the rank of the lattice. Okay, so there's the n block. Then we have... Okay, no, it's indeed the size of the lattice. Shall I explain? So, of course, the n is from here. Okay. It's because these have all got an extra um, point added into them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I you know nothing will, I think, at this point, help more than drawing what it is in this case. So let's try and do that. So the example continued. So in this case, we're going to have D is equal to... Um, so there's two struts. So N is two. So it's going to be a little identity block. And then I need to write down the first vector, which is three zero. And then for the second strut, it's zero one. And then I write down the vector coming from the U. So that's one for the first strut and zero for the second strut. And I have In this case, just one L. And for the first strut, it's the sum. So it's three. And for the second strut, it's this sum. So it's one. All right. So from this collection, we can also construct a Laurent polynomial. So to a strut T, we um, associate a Laurent polynomial and it's just going to be given by taking, oh, it's gone now, hasn't it? Taking the definition of a strut and turning all the additions into multiplications and you know, all the um, subtractions into the divisions and so on. So what we're going to have is the product over all of the struts. I mean, sorry, the product over all of the syntheses. And then the product over the vertices of those syntheses. 
That's the first double sum. And then, well, that um, multiplication becomes exponentiation. And subtracting off that point just becomes dividing by a monomial. And then the simplex delta i, we're just going to reinterpret as a sum of monomials. And then we need to subtract off the points of u. So that's the same thing as multiplying by the product of um, 1 over x to the cb. So. That's really just a literal translation of the um, polytopal description into a sort of Laurent polynomial. And so by construction, we have that it's Newton polytope is just equal to t. Then I'm really going to have to stop. So um, finally, to a scaffolding, T1 to Tn, we have F, which is just going to be the sum of these FTs. Okay. And then, if you remember, I have to um, add on the uneliminated variables. So I just do this. And this is n. And, and by construction, because this is a scaffolding for p, we have that the Newton polytope of f is equal to p. And the way I've set this up, if the hori rafa construction is going to work for this divisor data and this collection of line bundles, then this should be the mirror that the hori rafa method works. Okay, so I'm going to have to stop and let Alessio take over. Leave him a bit in the lurch. Okay, so can you hear me? Uh, let me sort of try to <clears throat> wrap this up somehow. Um, maybe I can clear this board. And uh, let, let me remind myself where what, what are we doing? So we started out with a polygon, polytope P. Yeah. Final polytope. And then we uh, I'll told you what's a scaffolding of P. And then, associated, okay, so maybe I'm, I'm going to summarize this as one, sorry, associated to a scaffolding, we have one, a, 
n times d plus 2 plus n matrix d plus some column vectors, Li's. And what that gives us is the okay, d and these Li's. This is the data for a toric complete intersection X in F. Some toric variety and complete intersection. So given a scaffolding, we have a complete intersection data. And then Al has also told you how to make a Lorampolin. Two. Well, again, that would be, if you like, the same sentence here. Associated to a scaffolding to one TN, we have one complete intersection data and two a Laurent polynomial. And um, uh, and one and two are mirror to each other. In fact, they are so under the Horivaf construction. And Let me sort of point out, um, if, if you start with the polytop and the scaffolding on it, um, there will be some assumptions, some further assumptions on that scaffolding that, that would ensure, for instance, that X is a quasi-smooth and well-formed orbifold. And we don't really know what those assumptions are. We do this on examples. In most cases, when we do it, X is a well-formed, quasi-smooth orbifold, but sometimes it isn't. So there is another thing about this construction. OK, so you know, in some sense, this is a kind of conclusion, okay, except that we'll further uh, wrap it up later in a, in a moment. But then let me um, uh, let me say another feature of this construction. There is a further. of this construction. OK. And you know, let me say it in words, and then I will make it a bit more precise. Actually, uh, you know, from the polyta P, uh, you can form the, the final variety, a toric final variety XP, and XP is one of these complete intersections in F. XP is a member of those complete intersections of the family.
of complete intersections. And we can, you know, write down its equation. And uh, let me tell you how to write it down. Suppose that I do the scaffolding, and then I get this data here, then XP is one of these. It's one of these, yes. No, no, it's one of these. There. Family, the one given by the scaffolding. Okay? And so, um, so introduce variables. corresponding to the columns of the matrix D, as we always do. And so, you know, this is an N by, I would like to say, not D plus C plus N, but N plus D plus C um, matrix. Okay? So I'm going to call the first N columns Y1 up to Yn. Okay, then these guys that are D of these, and so I'm going to call these ones y n plus one, all the way to y n plus D, and then these guys n plus D plus one, all the way to y n plus D plus C. Okay. So we introduce variables y1 up to uh, y n plus d plus c corresponding to the constant. Yeah, it is the size of the vector c. It is the size of the vector c. And how many S's do you have? Yes. Exactly. For each one of those, I have one column at the end. Because... Right, right, right. Uh, sorry, that's correct. In fact, okay, okay, right, right. You, you are right. Um, <laughs> so what, what do you want to call it? K. Huh? What's D for you? What's D for you? Uh, so, you know, but, 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 but the S's were a partition of, um, you know, you really should have asked Al about this because, you know, instead of, instead of asking me now, I mean, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, so in fact, actually, there are a few more variables then because uh, the uneliminated variables are even beyond that, it seems to me. the size of you, and I have to append it at the end of everything, and that adds it to all this stuff, in other words. No, wait a minute. No, 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 I don't know because, you know, I have to do something now that has to make sense. And, uh, you know, if, um, why didn't you ask Al about this?
No, no. There, there, is, there is, I think there is a K here, or a U maybe, okay. Right? There is an identity. There is an identity. No. You're paying attention at the wrong time. <laughs> uh, Sorry, I mean, so at the beginning there is this SI naught, okay? Okay, so there are C of them. Okay. And they form a partition of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Together with you, I see. I see. I see. I see. I see. I see. Sorry. I mean, I want. Uh, well, Sorry, I mean, um, let me just put like this. At the beginning, so what, what was the thing you called uh, uh, that we had at the beginning? And what was the dimension of n? It, the dimension of n was d. OK. And uh, this is somehow the thing that I don't terribly like. Um, so I want this to be k plus u. OK? And uh, and then indeed, absolutely. And then I want to be something like this. So. Um, I want to say that k plus c equal h, so to speak, OK? And then I want to call these guys all the way to y n plus h. And then here, h plus 1 all the way to uh, h plus u, OK? Maybe now you agree with me. OK. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so you know, this is all some large academic. So I'm just going to write down two monomials now, binomials. Uh, C, C, I'm going to write <laughs> C binomials. Okay? And so I'm going to write like this, hopefully. Let's see. For I. In one and C, I'm going to write binomials like this: product uh, J in S I Y N plus J, and then minus product K equal one to N of Y K to the L. I K. Okay. And my claim, the, the claim here is that these binomials define. Uh, XP in F as a complete intersection of the correct line ones. Okay. So, let me try to wrap it up, wrap it all up. So, remember at the beginning, uh, we spoke, I told you in fact, about this mirror symmetry program. And so, you know, mirror symmetry, as I said, is about toric degeneration. So we always start from a final polyp of P. Okay? And then we want to understand, enumerate, classify, whatever, study, understand uh, all families let me call this families M of deformations of XP to a final orbifold. And then to each of these families, for each of these families, attach a mirror. The Rand polynomial F in, you know, C, CP is a polytop in NR, and we want F in uh, C bracket N with mute F equal P. Okay? And um, there is a certain mutation in variance to these things. And so we want to be able to say things like that, for instance, for two different 
polytopes, P and Q, then the final XP and the final XQ, they're forming the same family, M, we want to be able to say that that's if and only if uh, the corresponding mirrors F and G differ by a chain of mutations. those algebraic mutations of Laurent polynomials. To the family of deformations of XP to an only. Um, okay, so they are attached to the, to the polytop and the family. They're attached to the polytope and the family. And, you know, this implies it's stronger than saying that P and Q uh, differ by chain of mutations. Okay. So this is what we're working on, and uh, we're working on some of the theory of this, okay? But uh, we're especially interested in the practice of this. So what did I say at the beginning of these lectures that we would do? Uh, you know, I promise that it would give you some practical things that works sometimes. And that's what we've done. So here's what we actually did. OK? So start from P. OK, we defined this notion of scaffolding. And you know, uh, you know, there is a complicated, like always with combinatorics, you know, it's sort of hard to get your head through a formal definition. But in fact, these things are reasonable, okay? You can draw pictures of them, and you know, that makes sense. And out of the scaffolding, A, a scaffolding gives one a family M of toric complete intersections. And XP is a member of that family. And so, in good cases, the general member of that family is a well-formed orbifold. So, this sort of answers partly part of question one. You know, we, I would understand all family, but here's a way to give to, to write at least one family down. And uh, two, uh, indeed, it, it gives it gives this mirror Laurent polynomial. So we can see that at least this goes some way in doing you know, what we want to do.
And um, that's it, really. Well, we didn't really talk much about three. We don't understand too well where we're working on it, but it's not so. So we can we can. Um, uh, th this is more like a question, okay? So, uh, in practice, but 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 it doesn't work very well, okay? I'm just put it like this, but but um, so so given a polyto P, you can look at various mutations of P, and typically, uh, in that mutation class, very few polytopes will admit scaffoldings. That sort of answers your question. <laughs> uh, no, no, let me just work out whether I'm finished with, with everything uh, or whether I want to say something more. Well, I suppose uh, um, that, you know, maybe I was somewhat defense. I mean, uh, in practice, even, even though this is limited, uh, not all deformations are into a toric complete intersection. This is a fact. And uh, we know several examples of that, and in some sense that's the most, most interesting case. Nonetheless, if you are interested in doing the yellow pages of all possible um, final LG pairs, this works. And you know it fills a large, you know, a large chunk of those yellow pages. It's not a theorem; it's a it's a feeling. We, you know, in the, in the in the corners that we've been looking at, we were able to fill almost all of the table using this method. And then there is a few extra cases where you have to work much much harder. Okay. And perhaps at this point I can stop. Um, I've stopped, that's it.